excited to bring on a farmer panel also to talk about their experiences with cover crops, what's worked, what hasn't worked, and just kind of share their journey. So here is our farmer panel we have with us. I think the last farmer panel I introduced from north to south. So this time I'll go ahead and go from south to north. And actually I'll let them introduce themselves. So starting with our uh, honorary South Dakotan on the panel, uh, Dan, go ahead and introduce yourself, name, where you're from, and a little bit about your operation. Yeah, my name's Dan Forgey. I'm from Gettysburg, South Dakota. I'm with Cronin Farms. We're long time no tillers and uh, really diversified cropping rotation. All right, thank you, Dan. And Tony, uh, Tony Wagner, go ahead and introduce yourself next, please. Hi, I'm Tony. I'm from uh, the Jamestown area, which is about 100 miles west of Fargo. I'm a fourth generation, and I've been messing around with, uh, with cover crops now since about 2005, and I've got about uh, eight different crops in our rotation. Awesome. Looking forward to hearing more about that. And Greg. Hi, uh, Greg Amundsen here in Gilby, North Dakota, about 30 miles west of Grand Forks. Uh, like Tony, I'm also a fourth generation farm and we mismanage 3000 acres of crop land trying to get cover crops to work on them. Okay, boy, if that's not a cliffhanger, I don't know what is. <laughs> Can't wait to get into that, Greg. Thank you very much. Uh, but Tony, let, let's start with those eight crops uh, that, that you have in your rotation. As you said, you've been doing this since 2005. Uh, so you've had a, a lot of time kind of trying to figure out what kind of results the cover crops are going to get to, for you. So maybe just kind of set the scene for us on, on your journey and your experiences with them to this point. Uh, I graduated from college in uh, 2003 and immediately started farming uh, right after that. And uh, the crops that we have in our rotation are corn, soybeans, spring wheat, field peas, flax, oats, barley, and rye. And uh, pretty much uh, kind of started uh, uh, my dad did quite a bit of no-tilling uh, right away from probably the, the late 90s. And uh, I guess I kind of uh, really started pushing uh, the no-till a little bit harder. And then uh, in 2005, uh, pretty much accidentally uh, stumbled upon uh, cover crops. Uh, it was literally by accident. And uh, you know, it's been many years of uh, trying to fine tune uh, different crops for different types of uh, soil and and what uh, covers to put on those uh, certain types of soil. So it's uh, uh, it, it's been a lot of growing pains that it hasn't been all sunshine, but uh, uh, the mistakes are the ones that uh, you really remember and that uh, really pushes you to try to, to figure out what it went wrong. What do you mean you stumbled on them by accident? How, how does that happen? Well, since we started raising field peas, uh, it went for a few years of not putting anything on the on the ground afterwards and and it seemed like the that crop was harvested in you no know, early part of July to mid July and it seemed like we still had a fair amount of growing time and and then if the ground happened to be open all winter and it, it possibly had a, a tendency of blowing of uh, getting a, a lot of dirty snow around it or if we'd get some heavy rains that it would start uh, washing because obviously anyone that raises field peas knows that that they don't leave very much residue. So uh, I talked to my consultant uh, who at that time we'd had for maybe maybe five years or so and I asked him if it's possible to double crop field peas after you just get done harvesting field peas and he said he had no idea. So I tried it and it quit raining after that. And uh, the only thing I put down was field peas on top of field peas. And the low spots all germinated, set pods, and then that was pretty much it. And I, I kind of thought it was a fail until I uh, saw how the, that, that winter, the field was really clean. Uh, it didn't have a lot of dirt. It didn't really have any soil blowing around, which it probably did, but you just couldn't see it as much as if it was bare. And then uh, the next spring was uh, really nice to plant into. And that pretty much started the wheel turning on starting to use uh, cover crops. Awesome, thank you, Tony. Uh, and Dan, I know you watch your organic matter closely, so maybe talk about your journey and what it's been like to try to build that organic matter up over time. We were longtime tillers and thought we were very good tillers. And then 26 years ago, we started in the no-till journey. And, uh, and through that, I mean, right now we're finding that the, with diversified rotation, we went into no-till diversified rotation here a few years ago when pulse and lentils, uh, pulse crops were good. Uh, we were raising quite a few pulse crops, but at that time we were raising 13 crops and we're down to 11 now. I think that's really valuable, the diversity. 
Uh, we try to plant covers after a winter wheat stubble, so 20% of our soils will have covers on them every year. Uh, we graze our covers and and uh, the, how we can, the, the longer we're in it, the, the more our soils are paying us back and uh, with the increased organic matters. Are we really uh, going 1% a year, not, a, not even close? A lot of times if we can get two ten, a tenth of a percent a year, I'm really tickled about. But it's just unreal how, uh, and we started planting cover crops in 2006. And we did it slowly with not uh, very much knowledge about cover crops. Right now, our kind of our issues with cover crops is uh, a sclerotina white mold carryover between if you have uh, if you had uh, uh, forage peas, field peas in your cover crop, or you have sunflowers in your rotation, soybeans in your rotation, lentils, and 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 then a lot of the times uh, you're, we're hearing Nebraska sometimes carry the disease over. So we're learning to manage our cover crops a lot better. Uh, one thing I one thing getting back to that too is. Uh, the carbon to nitrogen ratio of our cover crops. Uh, we're in a lower rainfall area. Our average is 18 inches. Uh, this year we didn't get quite get that much. But uh, I like, you know, a lot of guys, you, you're talking to hit 24 to one with your cover crop mix. And I like to start out with 34 to one. <clears throat> our soils are, are mature. So uh, we'll still, I want to protect the residue. I want to protect the soil armor. And so by doing that, we keep our soils cooler and then we let all the microorganisms keep feeding me even when it gets hot. But, uh, but anyway, it, it's, been a, it's been a long journey, but a good journey and, and, um, and it's paying us off right now with the, the soil health. Yeah, and, and Dan, you said you're, you've learned to manage your cover crops better. Uh, what have been kind of the biggest changes that you've made in terms of management that, that you've seen work? Well, a lot of times, uh, you know, I, I, there's been a lot of talk today about radishes and turnips, and they're very seldom used. The only time they'll be used on ours on our farm is in a grazing system, and then we never use any much. We we, we switch more to the collards and the and the kale, and then uh, another one is the the flax. Uh, just just love flax in a rotation. Very mycorrhizae. It stands through the winter. The cows don't really graze it. Doesn't really knock it down. That's great, uh, but. You know, so that's uh, the one thing we're trying to do more than anything is is just uh, change up and every field will be a little different. We don't have one set cover crop mix, but then every field is uh, just like you guys said earlier in the uh, right after lunch uh, that every field is treated different. I mean, you never do every it, every field is, is looked at in a different perspective as far as rotation, cover crop rotation. And great. Thank you so much, Dan. Uh, Greg, you left us with quite the cliffhanger there. So we need to hear about this journey of yours. I don't remember exactly how you framed it, but kind of take us back and uh, talk about some of the lessons you've had in your cover crop journey. Yeah, I guess um, I'm probably the uh, shortest term no-till slash cover crop guy on this panel. But, uh, you know, like I said, we farm about 3,000 acres and um, we mismanage it all. Well, it all depends on who you talk to. Uh, so we've, we've been trying to incorporate cover crops into our system as much as possible. Um, we don't, our goal isn't really, we don't really have a set goal with our cover crops. My biggest is just keep, keep, a, keep the ground covered and keep it green. That's our main goal. Um, we've had a lot of, we've had a lot of uh, mistakes over the years, but if you don't make mistakes, you're not learning. Well, talk more about that if you would, Greg, you know, what, what have been kind of, uh, what's something that you have changed that has really worked for you based on maybe a mistake or just something that just didn't work at the first time around? Uh, some of it was timing. Um, some of it double planting rates. Um, not so much um, varieties or um, species, but uh, as far as how we incorporate stuff, we used to uh, spread uh, uh, cover crop into our standing corn, and then we uh, like this year especially we uh, switched to interseeding, and just just changing up different uh, methods seemed to be working and fixing some of our mistakes. Uh, let's go back to Tony here. You know, Tony, I know. Uh, you try to keep as much of your acreage covered as, as possible, and you're sort of always, uh, you know, basically trying to keep that cover on there. What has been the challenge to making that happen, and uh, maybe any sort of solutions that you found that have improved your ability just to keep the soil covered? Uh, the, the fields that I usually try to keep covered are, are the ones that usually get harvested earlier by that August time frame. Uh, I've only messed around just a little bit with some corn. Uh, maybe when we top dress it, we'll uh, broadcast something in that would possibly start to grow once the, the foliage starts to uh, uh, dwindle and, and get a little bit more sunlight in between the row. But 
um, uh, pretty much uh, uh, it's kind of the same thing uh, Greg and Dan had said is uh, each field gets treated uh, completely different. You know, I've got some fields that uh, are very light soils that uh, I want it to winter kill and, and don't need anything growing in the springtime because I am afraid of, of possibly losing some moisture and and uh, the ones that uh, are, tend to be a problem in the springtime where there is a lot of moisture, I, I try to put in uh, uh, like a winter wheat or winter rye or something that will come back in the springtime. But uh, uh, the, the biggest compliment that I had received after trying to keep the fields covered all the time was uh, I had a neighbor had stopped me and said that uh, I had the cleanest snow in the township. So I, I thought that was... Uh, that was pretty neat to hear that. So, I mean, it's a uh, that just shows that that there's a lot of stuff moving around uh, topsoil that we really don't even realize, even if you can't see it. Like right now, there's still soil moving around, but you really don't notice it until there's a white background on it. Great point. Well, uh, Greg, let's let's kind of talk, you know, sort of dollars and cents on this. Uh, obviously. You know, we're trying to keep these living roots on the soil, and, and you mentioned, you know, cover crops that had worked for you, but in those that haven't, how do you kind of make the judgment call on, on sort of how to make the dollars and cents work about, you know, how much should be invested in this and where do you get the return? Um, that's kind of an interesting question, but as far as getting a return, I guess I don't really look at getting an economic return on, economic return on my cover crops. Um, I guess I've never really even looked at it that way for the most part. I just, you know, try to find cheap seed and get something growing as soon as I can after we harvest our small grains. Um, as far as, as far as other things, I, you know, I try, uh, try to get crops that help me, like I try to use radishes and different other things. I figured that economic return, I let them do my tillage for me. It's sure. basically how it works. Yeah. Yeah, Dan, I'd, I'd be curious also how you look at that too. Uh, and, and, you know, you've been doing this a long time and thinking about just the economics of it. You know, the, I, I'm going to uh, get back on Greg's comment because he made two really good ones, just like when he was saying he wanted something growing. And what he's doing is he's harvesting carbon. And that's the whole goal for everybody because carbon makes organic matter. So anytime you can keep something green, that's great. With us on our, on our cover crops, um, you know, it's pretty easy. Like we've got a, a quarter of a full season cover. The cows are going on about half our cow herd are going on. It's about 10 miles from the home. It's going to go on it next week. And, uh, but so that one there, you can kind of pencil out on the rest of it. We're just like Greg said, we're farming for the future. We're not looking at next year, how we're going to, we can't sit down with the banker and say, this is where we want to be. But when you come back in and you're, you consistently have 10 to 15 bushel better corn than than uh, uh, your neighbors or or uh, you better your yields every year on on uh, on all your crops and you feel good about it the crops got good color you feel good about it that's just the soil so them are the investments from sometimes we might have put cover on a field uh, three or four years ago and that's paying you off but i i really want to emphasize on that deal about harvesting carbon greg you're doing the exact what you should be doing Boy, you guys, that's a that's an important part, harvesting the carbon. That was kind of an interesting point that Dan made because he, he talks about the three to four years ago you had the cover out there and then you're seeing some of those benefits in the current year. And I know, Tony, you've seen some of those same things where it's maybe not the next year, but it's it's a year or two from then that you're seeing some of those benefits. Yeah, and I I'd actually uh, noticed it. Uh, usually you'd always think it was the next year. It's, uh, you know, everybody has this mindset that if you put covers on, this year, uh, for example, in 2020 and 2021, you're going to see the the yield jump. And for years, it just seemed like the next year there wasn't anything. But then it was two years after your cover. I've consistently noticed on our farm uh, a 13% yield jump. And it doesn't matter what crop goes in there. If you're putting soybeans down, corn, wheat, uh, it didn't seem to matter. You could have it side by side. Uh, a lot of the stuff I do is a lot of side by sides to see if if this is actually working because there's so many different variables, especially the weather, that I don't try to abandon uh, something that I've tried just because it didn't work one year. Well, what was it? Was did we not get as much rain that year? Was it uh, the certain 
couple weeks when it was flowering, did we not catch the rains? Is that what screwed it up? But what I've noticed is, is keep it just year after year after year of, of a side by side of covers and no covers. It seems like wherever I've got two years out from a cover, I'm consistently getting that 13 to 14% yield. And it was, it was pretty exciting when I found out about it because I believe I might have even, Abby, you might have been around or Lee was around, but I know I mentioned it to uh, uh, Dave Franzen too on our way to a meeting one day. And, and uh, he kind of thought that, or kind of filled it in and what he thought it was. So that was really interesting. But uh, until you see it on your farm, is, that's when you really notice it. Uh, go back to Greg here for a little bit, if we can, Greg, I'd love to hear just about what you're looking at right now. You know, what's coming next in your cover crop program? Uh, what's kind of something you're working through right now, or what do you, what do you see, where do you see things going for you? Um, so this year's our first year, biggest thing we're working at is, uh, this is our first year that we interceded. Um, there's a picture up earlier of our interceder that was up. Uh, that was 1.0. We're uh, working on 2.0 for next year, and we're going to try to, you know, get better at our seed placement and timing and also putting fertilizer down at the same time. So that's the biggest thing we're looking forward to for next year. Uh, other than that, just um, we'll hopefully get some moisture so stuff grows after uh, harvest. Got a question from the audience here and, and maybe we'll take this one to, to Dan. Uh, do you use check strips or, or any way to sort of evaluate as you're going along? Yes, we do. Uh, we're really, uh, we check things. We, we, we work really hard at that. Uh, one thing I'm just gonna, really quick, I'll give an example. We had we had a field of oats that really heavy stubble. And the year before it was the full season cover where we run our heifers. And so they ran on that last fall. Well, I left a seven acre strip in there and planted full season covers back on it again. So second year in a row. And so when you're harvesting that field, there was 12 bushel where there's two years of cover crop, there's 12 bushel increase on that seven acre strip. There's probably a reason for that because we speeded everything up. Every, everything was really ramped up, but still it just goes to show you the, the, the value of covers. One thing you guys talked earlier, when you talk about uh, like uh, this year is I, uh, the, best, the best defense you've got about if you should terminate your cover crops earlier is your soil probe. Uh, because I took one field out early because we just, I just felt we didn't have enough moisture. We were down to about 16 inches and it was pretty dry. And I just thought that was too much going to corn last year. So uh, that's, uh, I know you and Abby talked about that, about uh, what you do about if you should terminate and how far you should go with your covers. And I think in a drier environment, east of us down by Anthony Bly, is there in that environment right now? I think you really have to monitor that. And, this is all about management. I don't care what anybody says, planting the covers, taking the covers out, your cropping rotations, it's all about management. And uh, that's what makes it so exciting to me anyway. Uh, uh, Tony, what about you? You alluded to this earlier a little bit about, about you know, check strips or how, how are you evaluating as you go if you're doing the right thing for any given field? Uh, what we usually do is, uh, uh, like we'll take a, a field that's uh, say 40 acres or an 80, and we'll always split it right down the middle where there's uh, nothing obstructing from one end of the field to the other. And we'll always plant the same crops on it on both sides of this strip. But then what we'll do is we'll add covers to, to possibly one side of it. And then uh, once harvest comes, uh, we'll run and uh, weigh everything. We, we measure it all out and then we'll run it through a scale to see exactly uh, what kind of benefits that we're getting. And uh, I guess that's kind of our way of, of keeping track of really what we're doing. And the trafficability uh, is another big factor that I noticed too, it just coming across with the sprayer or we'll come across uh, with, with any type of piece of equipment, it'll actually notice if it carries you a little bit better, if you sink in a little bit more, or if it's a little bit wetter and then go up to the line and notice to see if there's any uh, um, visual difference in it. Uh, I guess that's kind of the way that uh, where I do a lot of my uh, test trials is uh, you know, it's always side by side, pretty much in the same field, not across the road. And and because you, know, you get around here and it's across the road can go from a sandbox to a mud clay pit. 
Tony, in that evaluation, are you adding just one thing at a time? Or are you doing a bunch of things at once in those side-by-sides? Or how are you making sure that you can pick out what that difference is? Usually, I'm just trying to, to do possibly one thing at a time. Uh, that way it doesn't get too radical because I've tried to do a lot of different things with all sorts of different strips and sometimes it gets really overwhelming and you, you just, you don't, what I guess I noticed is I, I really didn't notice a difference unless it's pretty much well black and white for what we're trying to do. You know, like if we're trying to put a cover down and it's like, well, this will be our experimental spot here. We're going to pull one cover out. It's still going to be covered, but we're going to, excuse me, pull one species out that I, I don't notice anything with that at all. So what we'll usually try to do is just one, one major change that we'll do. And, and that's why it takes so many years on so many different fields and, and we're still improving. I mean, there's uh, just, it, it's unreal from what I started off doing to where we're at right now is, boy, if you could just look back and, and change a couple of things that you did, but then, you know, maybe it needs this time, you know, maybe because we've been doing it for so many years, you, sometimes you need it to go through all these steps and you really can't skip anything because you would still possibly be in the same boat that you're, you're in now. Like, like my covers, I only run um, three to four different plant species and I try to keep it as cheap as possible. And uh, each one is kind of tailored for the soil type. Uh, Greg, uh, given that, you know, this year is quite a bit different than last year, um, you know, typically you have a pretty small window to get these cover crops in, depending on, you know, what you're doing, but how are you planting your cover crops? Uh, so after small grains, we come in with our no-till drill and plant, usually plant, try to plant in the same field. This year was just a little different because we were so dry. Uh, we changed things up a little, had some other digging rocks and some other issues. But uh, overall, that's, I mean, we just try to get in there as soon as possible with our no-till drill right afterwards, or we try to get in there as soon as possible as we can in, in inner seed. That's pretty much our, our two options of how we plant. And have you had any problem, you know, kind of getting in through residue and that sort of thing? Uh, no, we really have any trouble with it. Residue, like I said, our, our new inner seeder uh, should be a lot better than our old one uh, as far as getting it, you know, jump down pressure and tougher situations, especially going into next year if we're a little drier, you won't go, uh, we'll need a little more down pressure to get things in the ground, I think. And, and how are you evaluating kind of whether you, you talked about kind of the mismanagement before, but how, how are you sort of evaluating yourself to sort of make sure you're on the right track? Yeah, we're a little bit different. I know Tony was talking about, um, you know, splitting fields and doing stuff. Well, for the most part, we're just, I'm just too lazy for that. Uh, so I just go ahead and do the whole thing. Uh, to me, it doesn't matter. I just go ahead and do it. If it's going to work, it's going to work. If it doesn't, it doesn't. That's kind of my philosophy. Um, I guess is that's kind of how we evaluate things um, going forward. You know, if they work one year, we'll try it again. If it doesn't work, well, it doesn't mean it doesn't work. It just means it could be the wrong situations. I guess one thing we kind of kind of live by when we look at cover crops is there's a um, quote from a um, TV show that says that don't let fear or common sense uh, stand in your way. And that's kind of the way we look at things, except for, you know, common sense is perceived common sense, you know, is coming from a tillage background is totally different than coming from a no-till background. All right. Thank you very much. And uh, Dan, you know, let's, I asked Greg this question earlier, but I'd like to hear from you as well, because you've been doing this a long time now, you know, what, what are you still wrestling with or what's next in your program? The thing that, you know, you see happening next for you. You know, th that's a very good question because you, you, you uh, you always think you can see the light at the end of the tunnel, but you never really get there. And that's great because that keeps you moving. But like right now, uh, uh, the one thing is with us is on, on soil that we graze. And then we're trying to get our cattle to move farther away from the farmstead. They, they stay on the river pastures and they'll come home here like, you know, uh, probably next week. So you're looking at like the middle of winter to try to get places that six, seven, eight miles away from the homestead where we can graze. Cause you can save about 80 cents a day by grazing covers and it's good for the soil. Uh, another thing is, is that uh, the, as far as the check strips, so we do that. We there for about three or four years, we had check strips where we had a check strip with this, you know, like 40 foot wide, as wide as our drill and then replicated three times and you'd have seven different mixes in and you'd weigh the biomass and 
and uh, and uh, so you know we're trying to find out what was better and and now we just uh, we go for more the figure the carbon to nitrogen ratio and and what are what's a good graze and mix what's good for the soil, but it just uh, there's no clear cut anything to I, if you want to sit down and say what are you going to do next year next year next year I can't do it I can give you an idea I know what our we we pretty much stick to our rotations our rotations are very critical but I mean as far as the cover crops and the, the, it depends on the moisture and and where you go on this but all I can say is and uh, you know when you walk out on our land or any and I'm sure the, you guys are seeing it too when you walk out on our land or have someone come there and all of a sudden they when they step out and you're walking out there, they'll, you'll see them turn around and see them when they're moving their feet up and down because they say it feels just like a shag carpet. It's that <laughs> melt. And so, I mean, I mean, you guys are seeing that, Tony, you guys are seeing it, Greg, but I mean, that's kind of really showing you what the soil, the soil's given back to us. And all we did was try to take care of it. All we're trying to do is, is trying to take care of it and our soils are giving it back to us now. Dan, you talked a little bit about that increase in organic matter and, and you know, what you were happy with as far as a percentage increase, but what is, what do you consider to be a good amount of organic matter? You know, like with us, when, uh, when us, when we first started, uh, we were a lot in the two eights, the threes, and right now we're flirting with the, the fours, the, we have some up to four or five, and I'm tickled with that, you guys, because, uh, you know, I just, uh, you know, I can't really say, We've gained a tenth of a percent a year. I, I would like to, and that's a long haul, you guys. That's twenty some years, so that's not a. But uh, I really, I really uh, think that that's the whole key is the is the organic matter, and 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 uh, you know, one thing a guy has to remember on this whole thing: this isn't an easy deal. This is something that we you have to start. The sooner you start, the better you're off, and uh, just keep after it because it, it will pay you back. Oh, Tony, you've got a question in, in the comments here about your 13% increase uh, after two years with the cover crop. Have you seen that plateau at all? Is that like a 13% jump, you know, when you first get started with cover crops and then flatten it out from there? Or do you think it's continuing to uh, pay those dividends? Well, I, I believe it, it kind of keeps going up, but it, I mean, to the point of of a, of a big boost, I think this is kind of what I've noticed. It's almost like the top end of the boost, but what it seems like it's done now is it's taken out a lot of our peaks and valleys of these extremes for yields. It, you know, instead of, you know, pull into a, a field and you're going from one end to the other and our ground varies uh, from one end to the other. And it just, it seems like instead of pulling off, you know, like a eight bushel yield, and then all of a sudden you're hitting a a 25 and then a 40 and then you're like on soybeans for example and then you're dropping back down it, it seems like what this has done is it's taken out a lot of our peaks and valleys and, I, and i'm wondering if that's because we're able to possibly hold a little bit more more moisture uh, so i but i guess uh, uh where's it end uh, i don't i don't know uh, this is just what i've noticed over the years but but it's taken a while uh, this is, it seemed like it took probably about five to seven years before we actually started to notice uh, this jump. And then you start looking at your APHs and you notice that from year to year, it really doesn't, it, it doesn't vary uh, near as much. Well, thank all three of you guys. Really appreciate this. I, I feel like we could do these panels. This could be the whole thing. Just sit here and, and converse. I do want to give you a chance just if there's, if you know, 30 seconds each. I know we're running low on time, but if there's some thought that you came here with and we didn't get you to with our questions, I want to make sure we share that with the group. So, Greg, we'll start with you. Any closing comments or something you want to emphasize from this panel? I guess the biggest thing I want to emphasize is just try things. Um, as far as going forward, you know, people might think you're nuts. Uh, you know, I see, I think people are nuts that do a lot of tillage. Uh, just try it. Just see what works for you. Um, go from there. You know, the one thing that, that I keep telling people that, that uh, when you're trying something, start at a small scale. You're not going to change your whole farm in one year. So instead of trying a, a 400 acres or something, try 40 acres of it. And if it works, then you know it works. Uh, I, and because I think that a lot of times a person thinks you're going to change everything dramatically and you read about how people are really, you know, but this is a very good
good system when a guy gets it going. And the main thing is, is, is feed the soil. And one other thing too, is I'd really like people to do, and I know Abby and you guys do it, but I really recommend that you carry a spade, you know, because when you go looking at your crops, everybody's looking at what's growing on top. And, and really when you go there, carry a spade out in the field and see what's going on underneath, because it's just amazing to run that soil through your fingers. So that's my take. I mean, just carry a spade and look at your soils and just, You'll just be amazed. You'll be down on your knees and, and uh, just handfuls of soil. So I really recommend that. Thank you, Dan. Uh, and Tony, final comments from you. Uh, Dan and Greg have some really good uh, points there. Uh, it actually got to the point about four or five years ago where I didn't think that what we were doing was working anymore. Uh, we'd been doing it on pretty much all of our ground. And uh, uh, there was a picture that uh, that popped up that had two different types of of soil and one was uh, conventional and one was uh, the years of no-till and cover crop and when it really got to the point where i didn't think we we're getting anywhere we had the opportunity to buy some property right next to ours that had, had never had any uh, conservation practices on it and we went out and took a scoop from each one and the, literally there's a fence that divides the two it's the same type of soil, but just a fence divides the two fields. And uh, boy, if sometime if you could see that picture again, it, that was when I realized that what I was doing really works compared for the one that we had was a very dark soil and the ground that we just picked up was all gray and washed out. And, and that really gave me a lot of motivation to keep doing what we were doing. And how many years into that was that? Uh, the, <laughs> That one was probably a good 12 years okay. into it. Some takeaways from, from that panel. Certainly every field is treated differently. I mean, all three of those guys was pretty universal in saying that. And everybody's gonna have different goals and approach those goals differently. But um, you know, their use of cover crops is a means to an end to, to achieving their goal. And it's really neat to talk to people at all varying levels of how, how many years they've been at this on what they're doing.